I usually like to start with a clinical story. In fact, my 15, 20 minutes that I'll be talking today will be about a story uh, to describe what's going on between policy and data and clinical practice. So starting with a story, I find that clinical practice is always the most um, intriguing. Uh, and I always try to pick something within the last few weeks. So a few weeks ago, I was working in a level one trauma center. Uh, I was the trauma attending surgeon. And the emergency department, the emergency physician, called me down and said, we got something bad coming in. Um, we need you uh, ASAP. So go downstairs, and a minute or two later, a uh, kid comes in, 23-year-old kid, uh, had been in a motorcycle crash, um, really banged up, comes in screaming that he can't breathe, uh, low blood pressure, um, unclear what was going on. Uh, very clearly that he, he was dying. Um, very clearly he didn't have much longer. And the challenge is to figure out within the next few minutes what's happening. Uh, I know that he had been transported for the previous 15 minutes. The crash had happened 15 minutes ago. Uh, and I know that he had been transported, and a lot of information had been collected. Uh, I saw sheets brought in with handwriting from the paramedics. I saw leads on him and information that had come into uh, little data silos of devices that had checked his blood pressure and checked his heart rate. All this information would have actually been incredibly useful. Um, as it turns out, uh, healthcare is all about data and understanding patterns and signal. And I didn't have a lot of signal to work on here. Uh, this kid, luckily, over the next uh, seven, eight minutes, we figured out what was going on. Uh, it took the team of 30 people uh, that we had in the emergency department, about 10 doctors, uh, 10 nurses, and, and a number of techs and other people, uh, that we put in uh, chest tubes and lines and all sorts of things. And in the end, seven minutes later, we got an x-ray back that showed he had exploded his intestines into his left chest. And that was why he couldn't breathe. And in fact, he was bleeding in that area. Um, and so took him right to the operating room and grabbed his spleen and intestines, pulled it back, and uh, luckily saved his life. Um, but we face this challenge. We get in there in these seven-minute periods or longer periods where we're looking for a signal. We're looking for a pattern. And uh, this is really one of the biggest challenges in healthcare across populations for individual patients. Find that pattern, reduce the risk for the patient, across a population to reduce costs and improve outcomes for an individual to do the same. So I'll talk a little bit about my background and then go into um, how, this, how I've seen uh, healthcare develop, a little bit of a historic concept, uh, context. So when I was five, I started by playing video games, and uh, my family was good enough to give me a computer that had a keyboard, and I learned to program, and I loved it. Uh, by the time I was seven, the Apple II came out and absolutely loved that. And by the time I was 12, I found myself writing software and selling it. Uh, made some money better than an allowance. Uh, very interesting experience, learning to um, build things, commercialize things, not necessarily making me popular in high school. I think nowadays I would have done much better. But in the 70s, uh, you know, you, you sell your tape deck or uh, floppy. Uh, disc and, and hopefully do better than, uh, than you would on your allowance. Um, by the time I was in my 20s, um, I enjoyed being a student, but I actually did want a profession. Uh, healthcare IT didn't exist. Healthcare was so compelling and uh, went and applied to medical school, uh, was really lucky to be accepted. Um, by the time I had gotten a little bit into healthcare and I was on the road nine years of residency and fellowship, I found myself compelled to bring out technology to see it used by patients. I loved healthcare, I loved practice of care, but I also loved the technology as I had from being a kid. And MIT was kind enough to shape a program, a business degree with a focus in bioinformatics, and, and a lot more time in school, obviously, which I actually didn't mind. Uh, by the time I was 32, I found that getting information out and used was so amazing. Um, I turned down the real job. I tried to create my own company. Uh, got my first uh, product out and approved by FDA, I think, uh, about a decade ago. And subsequently, I found myself doing that over and over. It, it's such an amazing opportunity. Uh, now in my 40s, I find myself running a company full time. Um, and I try to contribute to society, which is an amazing opportunity. Um, but then during the weekend, 
uh, try to contribute to individual care. Uh, very few um, doctors are um, boarded in trauma, and the ability to work in a level one center and, and uh, try to provide very high quality care is, uh, keeps it real. Um, so as I look back on healthcare and what I've been doing with data, I found that availability and proper use of data really defines healthcare. Uh, so whether it's small data, big data, uh, from the time that we were um, building out trials, from the time that we've been understanding how to improve care, it's always the data. And you look back on this, uh, and, and history has taught us a lot. So looking back in classic times, uh, it was all individual and observational. A doctor or an anatomist would open up a patient, would understand some of the anatomy or physiology, uh, write it down locally. It didn't impact uh, the world. It didn't impact the region. Um, as you go on uh, to the Renaissance, we find that you're no longer just individual. Uh, you're still observational. But the doctors are now documenting and sharing information. Um, uh, this is my best attempt uh, in a, at a printing press. <laughs> Uh, but, but the idea that you can bring information together and share it was so powerful in healthcare. Um, by the late 20th century, we found ourselves moving um, from medicine as an art to medicine as a science. The randomized controlled trial became the definition of clinical best practices. And uh, that was a powerful movement in the 70s and um, 80s, where you see um, Practices change, and physicians get very grumpy, actually, that they're no longer enjoying medicine as an art. Um, and yet, the standard of care was much improved by the randomized trial. The RCT reflected very common conditions, and in fact, has gotten more expensive over time. Uh, the challenge is, it doesn't reflect the uh, unusual conditions. So we see in the 70s, a patient might have hypertension, or diabetes, or heart disease. And, and that was what patients looked like in the 70s and 80s. And the world of the randomized controlled trial made a lot of sense. Uh, but what we actually found over time is as the population aged, people had hypertension and diabetes and heart disease. In fact, to the point where some of the critical care doctors will say, oh, this is patient type 2. And everyone knows that's diabetes, heart disease, obesity. Uh, it, it, the patients are very complex now. And you can't actually run randomized trials on all these groups as much as we would like to. In a world where trials cost uh, tens of millions of dollars, you can't take each population and run a trial. And so we find ourselves uh, recognizing that complex cases are the norm. And we see technology jumping in to fill the void that doctors either couldn't or didn't. Uh, so you see Google and patients like me and WellDoc, I think has been mentioned as the first FDA-approved app uh, very powerful, uh, trying to jump in and fill this void, this lack of data. Powerful technology was very limited, though. So we had big data analytics. We had, um, we developed the cloud, but we found that we couldn't actually improve care. Uh, and this became extremely frustrating. This was recognized um, quite early, and in 2004, uh, George Bush created the Office of National Coordinator for Healthcare IT. Um, the organizing body for uh, bringing in data and healthcare. And in 2008, uh, President Obama uh, put an extra $27 billion to this, uh, basically turbocharged it. This is a bipartisan effort to bring data into healthcare. So now instead of looking at one patient which is defined as diabetic hypertensive, which is what we've been dealing with for decades, our uh, little coding system and our claims data, uh, instead, now what we see is applications looking for complete data, a real representation. So instead of what's put in in claims, which is called ICD-9 codes, we see real world data. Uh, and you can see how this is so important. Whether it's for individual management, that patient who is sitting there in the trauma bay, who had information come in through their devices and through the chart and through so many sources, or a population of patients that uh, where a small subset are at risk to come back to the hospital, to be very expensive in the system, to have very poor outcomes, you see a very good real-world representation of the patient really highlights what's going on, where the risk is, and where you can actually influence outcomes. So the country embarked on a journey. 
uh, to capture the full clinical record electronically. So now we're not looking at a few ICD-9 codes, little data bits. Now we're looking at a full text, a, a real representation of the patient and other information coming in electronically. And I think arguably we succeeded. Uh, I've been part of the effort, I think others in the audience has, have as well, to try to bring information into an electronic record. Um, but that was never enough. That was never the goal. So capturing information in electronic format was very different than making it usable. Uh, this is, in fact, what my company does. Uh, our team was the first to invent clinical natural language processing uh, back two decades ago, and we've gotten very good at pulling out information, creating a good representation of the patient for analytics. This is the kind of information you need uh, if you're going to do analytics to actually improve outcomes and reduce costs in healthcare. Uh, so data now being available, the real challenge, a great challenge, is making it usable. So we talk about these technologies, natural language processing, ontologies, inference and analytics, and I put, my, uh, I put it in a cloud because I want to highlight that healthcare has to go this direction. We can't continue to keep all the information local. Um, the great challenge is making it useful, but an even greater challenge um, is not just making it usable, but making it useful. So here we see measuring quality, reducing inconsistencies, aligning with clinical guidelines, improving effectiveness. This is, I think, what we didn't flesh out well enough um, back in 04 um, when the Republicans began this effort and in, um, in uh, 08 when the Democrats even put more fuel into it. We didn't flesh out how hard this was going to be. So now we've got the data collected electronically. Uh, firms like mine make it usable, which is uh, first, it's never happened uh, before. And you can see this progression where we went from uh, a thousand years ago to, uh, you know, with little tiny bits of data to a hundred years ago where we've got a, more information, but you see this exponential growth of uh, data. And now that it's useful, you can imagine the things that can be done. Um, the national goal remains to use healthcare data and knowledge to offer better, uh, more cost-effective and consistent care. And, and that truly is only going to happen by using it in the individual level to find that signal to do the clinical decision support and to help the doctor to give great care, and in the population level to find that signal of the patients that are about to get into trouble. It's that patient who has heart disease that's unrecognized or it's buried in the note uh, where instead of coming in for an emergency operation uh, that'll cost 10 million, oh, I think about $5 million, this is a patient I saw about a month ago, um, instead of having that outcome, you would have found that information, find the signal, and uh, turn that operation, instead of, instead of a uh, long operation in a month in the ICU, turn it into a short operation that's elective and a, um, and a day in the ICU. That's the kind of thing that actually changes healthcare costs and meaningfully changes healthcare outcomes, cost effectiveness and consistency. So the era of big data in healthcare, I think, has just begun. Um, I think that over the last decade, we've been working with claims data, two bits of information for an individual. Uh, you call them hypertensive di um, diabetic. Didn't get us very far. Got us a little bit of prediction. Got us a little bit of uh, communication. I think now we've entered the era of full clinical data, and we're actually lobbying very hard for um, capturing the full clinical record, true interoperability, meaningful measures of quality. Um, and I think over time, you'll see the full data come in, and that'll be the um, devices that are attached to the patient in the ambulance, and that'll be the Fitbit, and that'll be the social media with the patient writing information to each other. Um, I think that that has to be the direction over time. So this is the beginning of an era. I think arguably uh, we couldn't move anywhere without uh, large data sets that were actually in electronic format now being made usable. Uh, but it's incredible uh, opportunity uh, that I hope many in the audience will be um, uh, working with is to make healthcare better. Uh, the U.S. being in a great position now that we've put a lot of money, resource, and energy uh, into um, the infrastructure. I thank you for letting me talk. <laughs>